programming language tier list for coding interviews. Now I'm gonna right. have to throw R in the dumpster. C and C++ <laughs> are both firm in All the right. A category. Right, hold on. So R in the dumpster, I'm I'm okay with, especially for a coding interview, unless you're applying for like a data science job, in which case, sure, use R. But if you're applying for a software engineering job and use R in a coding interview, it's gonna raise a bit of a red flag and it's probably not going to work very well. C and C++, I actually disagree with for coding interviews. C especially, you're going to have to spend a lot of effort creating things that in most languages already exist. And I think it would be almost impossible to finish some coding interviews in C because of the fact that coding interviews are for data structures and data structures, at least built in data structures, aren't as much of a thing in C. So it's just going to be much, much harder. So I highly recommend against using C. C++ you can use. I think you're going to run into some of the same issues of it being super verbose, but C++, if that is your best language, it's fine to use in a coding interview. Well, I'm going to place in a B. It's fine. It's a good language. It's just a little bloaty. And we all know. All right. So I use Java for a lot of my coding interviews, and I would agree it's probably around B tier, although I think it's probably about the same as C++ in terms of bloatiness. So I don't know why C++ is actually higher. I would almost say Java might be a better language for coding interviews if you had equal level proficiency in both. Although there are certain things it won't be very good for. For example, I had an interview once where I had to make a request to some API and I was using Java and I remember asking the interviewer like, hey, I think I'd be able to do this much easier in JavaScript. Would it be okay if I did that? And I was shocked, but the interviewer told me no. He was like, no, I need you to use the language that you like signed up for the interview in or whatever, which I was not expecting. But then I spent the entire interview trying to figure out how to make an HTTP request in Java because I just never done that before. And I don't know why anybody would have done that before versus in JavaScript, I would have been able to solve the whole question in like five minutes. So that was a little bit frustrating. Did not pass that coding interview, although it was sort of a weird interview anyways. It wasn't really a data structures and algorithms interview. It was more practical in nature, although I don't really I think making HTTP requests in Java is particularly practical, but is what it is. C sharp is pretty much the same thing. Perl, I've literally True. never used. Let's put it at C. Now, JavaScript, I'm going to put as an A. I like the language, but it's not quite built for coding interviews. Now, I have absolutely hot take, but I actually think JavaScript is a pretty good language for coding interviews. And a lot of people like to use TypeScript, which is fine. But personally, I actually think JavaScript in coding interviews can be better than TypeScript just because it's a little bit less verbose and it can be a little bit quicker to write, especially if you're using like a whiteboard where you have to handwrite it, then JavaScript over TypeScript I think is oftentimes better. And I actually find that a lot of the functions built into JavaScript can help a lot. So I actually think JavaScript is a pretty good coding interview language. Yeah. No clue what any of these languages are. If you guys know, please <laughs> tell me in the comments. So okay, and isn't this VI- This bird thing? I'm not sure. I'm not sure about this one either. I think the one on the end is, um, I think that might be a form of Lisp, but I could be wrong. And then this guy up here that he just put an A tier, I think is going to be PowerShell. Yes, code. I swear that's, no, that's an not VS code. To finish this I off, let's put assembly in the garbage. PHP slightly Fair. higher than the garbage. And Python, Fair. I literally swear, is built for coding interviews. Yeah, I would agree. Python's probably the best language to use in coding interviews if you do know it. One thing I will say, though, is if you have interviews coming up in like a month and you aren't very proficient in Python, but you know Java or C++ or C Sharp or JavaScript or whatever it might be super well, just use whatever language you already know well. Don't try to use Python just because it's like the coding interview language. Although I will say if you have six months to study, it might be worth your time to learn Python because it is a very good language to use in coding interviews. By the way, if you're studying for coding interviews, I highly recommend you give Algo Expert a try. I'm actually an instructor on the platform and there are some free problems on there. So I'd recommend just try the free ones, see if you like it. And if you do keep using it. And if you don't, if it's not for you, that's perfectly okay too. Dude, this vibe coding trend of using vibe AI coding for everything has to stop because look at this code my intern posted. Oh boy, intern so season. Good and everything looks fine, but then there's this try catch here, right? So the try does something, but then the catch just asks OpenAI to fix the error. Wait, intern. And then console logs the fix. This intern's like, kind of onto something. What is, how is this going to work, man? <laughs> AI is just going to return That's kind of genius. Stuff. So I was like, fix this. There's better ways to do this. Fair. And then this is what they come up with. So they didn't even change anything. They similarly just do an OpenAI call, but now it returns only the code. And then they just eval the fix. Yo, make this intern C CTO. <laughs> That's actually genius. I love that. I wonder. <laughs> how frequently this would work, because I actually think there's a non zero percent of the time that something like this could actually work. I also wonder if this is real. Like, did an intern actually do this or is this just like a skit? But either way, it's funny. 
<laughs> what? Maybe this is genius and I'm just the idiot because this will just retry fixes until something works. So honestly, oh, I keep through trying like this, but yeah, this is crazy. This new trend of using AI for everything is kind of nuts. Yeah, I mean, it is funny, but she is also right that the trend of like just use AI for everything is sort of nuts. And a lot of these problems just don't need AI. And I think we'll find that over time that we sort of pull back a little bit on where we're using AI and we're more sort of selective in how exactly we're using it. But also kind of curious if this would work because it's kind of genius. How long do you think it'll take to build this? Two weeks, maybe three. If I found you a second developer, could you do it in one? So it doesn't really work that way. It does okay, not. Okay, I'm confused. I can see that. More people <laughs> won't make it go faster. Right, but you could share the workload. No, come here. Oh, it's gonna be the oven analogy. Meatballs, how long are these gonna take to cook? I don't know, 20 minutes? Come on, And oven. what if I gave you a second oven? Could you there cook it is. faster? I suppose if you connect them, make them twice as high. How would you connect them? Yeah, you just put them like face to face. What? No. But then I guess the heat would get out because the doors are open. When was the last time you used an oven? What if we just took the doors off? <laughs> Is it bad if I say that I don't think I've turned on the oven in my house in like at least six months, maybe like a year? It's probably nasty in there. I sort of live off DoorDash, not gonna lie. Mmm, stop. Uh, no. Let's, we're, we're gonna try again. Um, ah! Coffee. If I ask you to make a coffee, how long would that take? I don't know. About a minute? And I give you a second coffee machine. Can you do it faster? Mm, no, but I could make more coffee in the same amount of time. Okay, you're on the right track, which is still more coffee in less time than it used to take. And we're off the track. Okay, that was funny, <laughs> bad example. What was wrong with that? You know what? I can do it in a week, okay? <laughs> this is actually so realistic of conversations that I've actually had where it's like, it does not matter how many people you throw at this. It doesn't matter how many resources you throw at this. Some things just have natural constraints and that exists outside of just software engineering, right? There's so many things where it just does not matter how many extra people you add to it because the process of adding more people adds complexity to the actual workflow that can actually make things take more time. And I think the number of developers you need oftentimes sort of scales with the size of the project, which of course makes sense. But sort of what I mean is if you have some small project and you put a hundred developers on it, it's not going to be a hundred times faster than if there's one developer. But if it's a massive, massive, massive project that would have taken that one developer, say 10 years and you put 10 developers on it, now it's actually probably going to go significantly faster from those extra developers because they'll be able to sort of spread out the work and not be sort of stepping on each other's toes and things like that. That's why you're the best. Oh, fight me. <laughs> Here's how I spend my $157,000 software engineering salary as a 23 year old. My gross nice. income this month was $13,386. But right. because I live in California, $4,568 of that went to taxes, which is 33% of my income. So my take home was $8,020, which I recognize okay. is a lot of money for a 23 year old. And I'm very blessed this Big month. I spent right $1,579 on living expenses. That's my rent utilities and internet. And yes, wait, hold on. You're telling me he lives in the Bay area for under $2,000 a month. And to be fair, this was July 30th of 2023, but that is wild. I don't think I've ever heard somebody whose rent was that low in the Bay area in the last like five years. So he must be living like in a closet, sharing it with roommates or something insane, but good for him. Save this the money. Is cheap for San Francisco, but I live with roommates and I got a good deal. I spent $560 like on groceries just for myself. I eat a lot. I spent $236 on a gym membership, athletic greens, and other supplements. I the gym membership and health stuff is interesting because I think a lot of people will look at that and be like, that is way too much money to be spending on a gym membership. And it is a lot. It sounds like a lot. I don't know what the supplements are. So maybe a lot of that is supplements. I know Backside's super into fitness stuff. But one thing I will say is when you get to some point of not necessarily like financial freedom necessarily, but a point of financial comfort, one thing I personally like to do is to start splurging more on things like fitness and health because those are the things that matter the most. And if having, say, an expensive gym membership, a membership to Equinox or something like that is what's going to get you to actually go to the gym, then by all means, splurge on that a little bit because that is just one of those things that is super important to be doing. I spent $188 on eating out and I spent $89 on fun. I spent $100 on that. transportation on. to work. I spent 97 bucks on a new fan and 163 bucks to subscriptions on different services. A lot In of total, subscriptions. this month, I spent $2,985. So for my nine to five software engineering job, I saved $5,035. But as I mentioned in a previous video, I make some money for my TikTok now. 
in total for my TikTok this month at taxes, I'm making around $4,000, which brings the total nice. amount That's that I've good. saved to $9,035. If you're wondering what I do with all this money, I maxed out my Roth IRA. I have a Love fully that. funded six month emergency fund, nice. dollar cost average into the S&P 500, and yep. I'm now saving up money for a down payment on my first house. Oh yeah, nice. I also don't have any debt. If you want to see how I became a software engineer, leave me a follow. And if you have any questions on any of the things I mentioned, leave a comment below. And by the way, his info and the info of all of the creators in this video will be in the description. So do actually go follow them if you like the content you see. And I do think this is a great breakdown. And it's cool to see that you can be a software engineer living somewhere super expensive like the Bay Area and still save a lot of money. It is possible to live sort of below your means and save a lot of money, even in these super high cost of living areas. It is obviously easier if you have that salary somewhere else, but it is possible to save a lot of money in the Bay Area. I think some people think of it as like, oh, if you live there, you have to spend $4,000 a month on your rent and you have to have all these expensive things. And it's just not necessarily true. You can live somewhat affordably in that area and save a lot of money. Although I do think the ultimate sweet spot is still Seattle because in Seattle, you get essentially the same or very close compensation to the Bay Area and New York, but with no state income taxes. So you can save a lot more money. But by the way, you can save a lot of money as a software engineer if you have one of these high compensation packages. Software engineer day in the life, realistic 9 a.m. Hold on. 9 a.m. is not realistic in the day in the life of a software engineer. Let's be honest here. We're 10 a.m. is early in software engineering land. But all right, we got stand up at 9.45. So for me, yesterday I did what I was supposed to do yesterday. And today I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do today. And that's pretty much it from my side. Fair. Deep focus in the in the TikTok feed. Love that. This Debugging. literally makes no sense. How's that? <laughs> lunch at 1230. I like that lunch was an hour and a half and it was followed by deep focus, which seems to be more scrolling. Love that. Pretty realistic. More coding. Debugging. Logging off at 5 p.m. This is something I never really understood. This is a real thing that people do where they just sort of like sit around until like right at like five or whatever time they feel comfortable leaving. But I never did that. For me, it was always like, once I'm done with my work, I'm out of there. And maybe that was just like, I had a good manager who was okay with that and recognized like, as long as the work is getting done, it's getting done. But the idea of just like sitting at your desk, waiting for the time you're supposed to clock out or whatever, to me always felt dumb and sort of pointless. Our first coding interview is insanely nerve wracking. Here's some things to keep in mind. True. Number one, the interviewer, at least if the company doesn't suck, is on your side. This is not an interview. but yeah. This is a company looking for great people to join their team and to help them grow. They are not trying to force you to slip up so that they can then go and laugh behind your back about how stupid you are. Ask questions if you get stuck, talk your way through problems, and I'm 99% sure that you're going to find out that the interviewer is going to be more than happy to help you out. And honestly, yeah, this is a huge thing. When you are in coding interviews, ask lots of questions, act sort of like you are collaborating with that interviewer, not like the interviewer is there to interrogate you. Act like they are your coworker and you're working together and trying to figure out a solution to this problem. I think that's a much better way to approach it and it tends to work out much better. If they aren't, then you probably don't want to work there anyways. Number two, True. don't stress about solving the full problem. Don't get me wrong, if you Agreed. take 30 minutes to reverse a string, that's probably not great. But with a lot of the harder questions, don't see them as like, if I don't knock this out, the park, then I'm screwed. Interviewers really just want to see that you can use your brain to think through tough problems. If you're talking your way through it and you're asking lots of clarifying questions and doing everything that you can to try and get to that solution, then you're probably doing well. Even if you don't necessarily finish the entire problem or get the perfect solution. Yeah, so I think I've told this story before, but that's actually what happened with me when I first applied to Facebook. My phone screen, I got the question completely wrong. The interview started with the interviewer asking me, do you know what a try is? The like data structure, it's sort of like a tree, a prefix tree. And I was actually taking data structures at the time of this interview. It was an intern interview. And I was like, uh, no. And I remember like going through my head, like, should I lie and pretend I know what this is? Or should I just say no? And I just said no. And the interviewer explained to me what it was. And then he asked me this question and I tried to answer it. And I guess I made some progress, but my code never worked. I don't even know if it even compiled, but definitely did not work. I was not able to solve the problem. And that interviewer actually told me after that interview that he thought I did an incredible job. And he told me that he actually appreciated the honesty in not knowing what it was and that he was able to sort of see my problem solving in that way. And 
that I was sort of open to learning something new and trying to just think critically through this problem, even if I wasn't able to actually solve the problem. And he did pass me in that interview and I ended up getting the job. So is that the optimal way to interview? No, it would probably be better if you just are able to solve the problems. More often than not, that's going to have the better result. But sometimes the interviewer is not always looking for you to solve something perfectly, especially with a very, very hard question. Oftentimes in those, they're just trying to see how you think and how you go about trying to get to that solution. Failing is just part of the journey. I have failed True. plenty of interviews. We Same. all fail interviews. Whoever the person is that is interviewing you has almost certainly failed a bunch of interviews. This is honestly True. just the game that we play. If you fail, you just try again. It's as easy as that. You are not a terrible programmer because you couldn't reverse the linked list fast enough and the guy was dick about it. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. And one thing I'll say is that the entire interview process, whether it's for a software engineering job or something else, is in some ways just a numbers game. The more places you apply, the more opportunities you have to pass the interviews and to get the job. So don't take it too personally if you fail an interview. Sometimes this is just because you had a bad day, because the interviewer had a bad day, because you got unlucky with them asking you a question in a domain you don't know as much about, or whatever it might be, and is what it is. You can't change the past, but what you can do is just keep applying until you find one that you are able to pass that interview for.